It's our KSAT Q&A segment where we take our questions and your questions to experts and try to separate some of the facts from the fiction that are out there. And of course, there are a lot of questions about COVID-19 and the surge we're in, whether you call it first surge, second surge, whatever you call it, we are clearly something is going on trend wise. We are joined by Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Doctor, as always, thank you for joining us. And, and we've got a lot of viewer questions about school. There are a lot of parents out there that are wondering, you know, do we are we rushing too soon to go back? You know, a lot of schools going back early August. What do you say to parents out there that that are having concerns right now? I think everybody should keep in mind that what matters is not so much the dates, but the data. And we need to, um, of course, try to plan, which does mean you need to start thinking about dates, but understand that whether those dates make sense or not at the time is going to depend on what we're seeing in the community in terms of new cases, hospitalizations, and hospital stress. So that's really important, and it can be highly variable from one community to another. So that makes it tough to say what exactly is going to happen here in San Antonio or in Bear County. And we use models to try to help us predict those sorts of things. Now, there's other, there's, yes, go ahead. No, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, we have tools um, and the CDC has uh, posted on their website a really useful tool for people to assess whether their schools are ready to open. It's, it's available to the public and I urge parents to go to cdc.gov and take a look. Um, and, and that walks you through the thought process that you need to go through to decide is it safe. And the first question that you ask is, first of all, is our school able to take precautions to protect the kids and the employees that are at risk for a bad outcome? So that could be, say, kids with asthma, um, older teachers who are over the age of 64 or people that have underlying other health conditions. And if you are not prepared to take care of those people, then you need to put the brakes on uh, reopening and, and be a little more careful. If you are ready and if that reopening is in keeping with local, state and regional guidelines, then you have another set of questions that you need to ask and they include, can you mask? Can you screen when people are coming in, kids and employees? Can you take their temperature and can you screen for their symptoms? And if that's not possible, you really need to put the brakes again and get ready before you open the doors of the school. Staying on the topic of schools, Dr. Berger, and one of the things that we learned today was that the Texas Education Agency, the TEA, is expected to release these guidelines this Tuesday. What do you think these guidelines should include? Well, I, I fully endorse what I've seen on the CDC website, and we really need to have masking going on. We need to have small groups of kids wherever possible. It's going to require some modifications. We need to have classrooms set up so people can be sitting far enough apart where they're not touching each other, not violating that six-foot space. There needs to be a lot of work done to clean the environment and make sure that that hand washing is emphasized and that the hand sanitizer is available. But you know, one of the most important things, one of the most important things is masking and also screening for symptoms on walking in the door. And I think that if you can't do that, it's really not safe. Dr. Berger, I know that you're not an emergency room doctor, but I do know that that you do rounds. I know that you are in touch with people who are in the emergency room and you are in, on occasion down there. What are you seeing in the emergency room? Are you seeing the trend in numbers that we're seeing uh, countywide at University Hospital? It's for sure happening at University Hospital. We are the county hospital. We have a large and busy emergency room. Lots of patients come to us. You know, one day this week, I, I rounded uh, with the doctors that are on the COVID dedicated service, and they told me that the night before they had had 12 new patients come in and go to the intensive care unit. So a lot of these folks that are coming in right now are younger than the ones we've seen in the past. We've had people in their late teens and early 20s not only get sick enough to come to the hospital, but get very, very sick in the intensive care unit. So we're seeing a definite uptick we're seeing beds being taken up by COVID patients that weren't being 
taken up before. And we can anticipate based on modeling and predictions of the curves and the trends that we're on, that this is going to double in a couple of weeks and we're going to be having trouble finding the beds. And just following up on that, Dr. Ruth, I know the concern several months ago was that we would not have enough beds. We would not have enough PPE to get us through this crisis. Is that still the concern right now? So if we don't reel it in and um, curtail these new cases by improving our masking and the social distancing, it is possible that we could see a surge that would take us to a peak of like 1,900 hospitalizations in a day, um, need for 1,900 COVID beds by the middle of August, okay? Well, that's problematic because our current COVID bed capacity is about 1,400. So we could exceed our capacity and we could be getting to that by late July if we don't do something to curtail the new cases. But here's the good news. Our models actually show that this can be done and it doesn't require going back to sheltering in place. What it requires is universal masking, social distancing, and avoiding having people congregate in indoor settings. And we need to have people avoid going to crowded bars, gyms, and indoor parties. We need people to move these kinds of activities outdoors and reduce the number of people that are present, reduce the, the, the closeness of the people, increase the distance between the people, and uh, do all the other things that we've talked about, like hand washing. But we don't have to completely shut down the economy. And so I am encouraged by these models, but it requires that everybody has to step up and do their part and wear their mask and remember the rules. I want to I want to put up the, the graph that we have. We have one of those mm -hmm. models that uh, I, I know that, that you at UT Health San Antonio found especially uh, helpful in this whole thing. And if we put <laughs> it up, you can see that there is you see the blue, the blue or the gray line that that goes up rapidly. These are the number of hospitalizations. So. So, Dr. Berger, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got the gray line that is the rise, and, and that's what the trajectory we're currently on. And then the red line is what happens if we practice with the masking and the social distancing, correct? That is exactly right. And those are predictions that are not pulled out of the sky. They're not pulled out of the air. These are specific to San Antonio, and they include, they take into account the size of our population, our population density, how many people have to use public transportation or not, and the kind, the dates at which we put in our uh, mitigation measures into practice, and also the dates at which we started relaxing restrictions. So all of these things are factored in, and this is San Antonio specific data. And if we do nothing, we're gonna see that blue-gray curve that goes up pretty high and peaks around mid-August. If we reel it in with our masking and our social distancing and de decreasing the congregation of people, then we're gonna see that much, much flatter curve where we never get close to exceeding the maximum bed capacity that we have in San Antonio. What, That's a far preferable outcome. How do you make up, I mean, if, if we have close to 2,000 uh, p patients that need beds and we only have 1,400 beds. I mean, are we talking, I mean, obviously Freeman Coliseum needs to be brought back into action. Are we talking field hospitals? Are we talking maybe places that aren't currently used for hospital beds being used? Is that what we're talking about? All of the above, including every hospital has uh, post-operative uh, acute care units that can get, get turned into COVID care areas. You know, we have floors that are largely used by people that are having some sort of physical rehabilitation, those people might be able to move elsewhere to other facilities so that we could open up those slots uh, to provide care for COVID patients. It will take a lot of work and a lot of creativity and a lot of organizing. Fortunately, we have a really good emergency response group, the STRAC, um, and the Emergency Operations Center thinking carefully about those things and planning ahead. So I believe that we can expand our bed capacity in San Antonio. But nevertheless, we can't get away from the fact that that curve that shows if we do nothing differently than what we're doing now, is gonna take us up above the number of beds that we have available. A dangerous prospect. Thanks you so much, Dr. Ruth Bergren, as always for your time and for your expertise. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Bergren. And again, this can be avoided. Yeah. Mass, sure hygiene, can.
you know, with this social is, distancing, all of those things. We've okay. done it before. We can do it again. Sure we can. Yeah. And we need to. Thank you, doctor. We'll be right back.